fun part of, of the conference. Uh, first, I want to thank, again, Professors Grobman and Sachs for inviting me to chair this session. It is a great honor, and I'm quite excited. I actually did not really sleep last night for, for no reason, just for, because of... Um, this session is entitled Fabrication Revolutions. Uh, it will bring together um, a local startup developing robotic fabrication methods. Uh, join it with a PhD student questioning how to introduce AI into BIM and construction. And end with Philip Block's amazing keynote speech about new ways to design, build, and fabricate using traditional masonry elements. I think. What joins these speakers is their constant struggle to bring up-to-date technologies, both computational and physical, into the outdated world of construction. Uh, so please sit back and let them take you for a ride into a fascinating world of technology, construction, and fabrication, one which would have been perceived as science fiction only a few years ago. Uh, we will begin with... Um, Yoav Fekete. Yoav Fekete studied math at the Ben Gurion University, where he also completed his joint computer science math master's degree, researching knowledge-based representation and logic-based AI. Since then, he has been working at Beyond 3D, the first Israeli startup company that specializes in developing robotic technology, technologies for robotic construction. I am personally very interested in this work because I used to work for Beyond 3D before I started my PhD. And it's been three years since I saw what they're doing, so I'm really dying to know what they did in the last three years. Um, uh, so you have joined Beyond 3D four years ago as an algorithmic developer, and in the past two years, he serves as the head of software department. Uh, from our personal acquaintance, I also know that he's an amazing sitar player who somehow manages to lead a do life, a uh, software developer by day, professional musician by night. It's very impressive. Uh, so, you off? Please take the floor. Hi, everybody. So, first of all, I'm very excited to be here today. It has been uh, very interesting for me to hear a different perspective on the ongoing work uh, that we are part of, of the collaborative work uh, that so many different fields have to collaborate in order to bring to reality. And I want to uh, apologize for the CEO for a company, Ron Berman, who couldn't uh, come here. He had uh, an unexpected meeting. And uh, for me, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to show uh, our work to Guy, uh, which is uh, a good friend and my cousin also. Um, so let us begin. So um, b b before I start, I want to show you um, that after uh, this session, you're welcome to come and see we have here samples from our uh, production lines. All these very colorful things, which you might think are plastic, are actually concrete. And we have a very interesting um, system that enables us to uh, create a seriousable mass custo com customization of cement products. Um, so I'm going to start, actually, this is the end of the session. This is why I wanted to start with, with the interesting part. And I'm going to connect us to uh, the bigger picture of the industry 4.0 revolution. Because in, until now, uh, everything was concentrated on the, on the beam technology, and there is a bigger uh, change happening that us as uh, uh, industries, as in factories, uh, we're connected to. Um, so who we are? Beyond 3D is an uh, Israeli startup founded in 2011. Uh, we are doing a multidisciplinary research, uh, developing uh, robotic uh, fabrication systems. Uh, we have uh, material uh, engineers, uh, we have computer scientists, algorithms, uh, architects, and uh, we've been uh, doing this uh, R&D for a few years. Um, so, what the, what are, what's the goal of our company? 
so the first thing is that we want to uh, uh, manifest a customizable serious production, which we will talk about what it is, because all of us usually are know, we know a mass production, which is the way most of the industry works today, and we know the concept of um, mass customization. And uh, customizable serious production is a hybrid model, which comes uh, in the middle, and we think it will help to uh, move forward the construction industry from its current state, which is basically uh, industry 2.0, and to move it into uh, the next level. Um, so, in order to do it, we are uh, implementing a, a first a robotic uh, factory uh, in Israel for construction, which will enable us to uh, produce around 5,000 square meters of uh, concrete uh, each week uh, in different shapes and colors, as we will talk uh, uh, later. And in the top of the, our, go our biggest goal is to change the construction paradigm, which now, um, if we're, uh, which is very, you could say, primitive, hasn't changed in a lot of uh, ways since uh, the Roman times. And I'm not talking about the, the design, I'm talking about the practice of how you build it in the field and the uh, problems and inefficiencies that we see in the market as a result. So if we look at, uh, if we go over research about uh, market efficiency, we see a very interesting and strange trend. If you look at uh, non-farm uh, uh, productivity, all the heavy industry, except for uh, construction, you see that uh, since uh, in the last century, uh, we see productivity rising. And if you look at the construction productivity, you see the opposite graph. Actually, the more we advance with technology, the productivity goes down. And this is, even though we have a penetration of the building, uh, the beam technology and the CAD technology for all over uh, 20 years. And what are the reasons for that? So uh, we, uh, we did a bit of research in our company and we uh, looked about the penetration of digitalization into the industry. And what we found out, that there is a straight correlation between inefficiency and uh, not using digital, digitalization methods. So construction company is in the last place in the world, in, in the industries, in, in, in using uh, dig digitalization. And the, there is actually a lot, a lot of reasons for that. And there are two very interesting reasons. The first is that the industry model that was used until now, the mass customization as a mass production, does not fit the construction industry. In the construction industry, as you probably know, uh, every architect wants to design a different uh, product. So mass production does not fit. And this is maybe the main reason you don't see uh, uh, mass produced stuff, because there is no need for it. Uh, the other reason um, the other reason is that you need, uh, because of the pipeline of design, it's so complicated and so segmented, from the initial uh, architectural design until the builder in the end of the day that has to put the, the, f the flooring, uh, to make all these systems communicate together and collaborate. I'm talking about the software uh, themselves. As, I, s I sat here the entire day and I heard so many people talking about this. The fact that you have so many, sta you, lack of standardization. There is no uh, single beam representation. I Googled it a few days ago and I realized that each country has a different standard. And this uh, makes it very, very problematic to develop new technologies for this market. And as previous speakers uh, talked about, we have a lot of inefficiency in this market. Uh, some survey that was made in 2004 in the US market alone uh, realized that there is 15 billion loss per year, um, which is due to uh, 
few reasons. First of all, is over budget of projects. Um, of course, we are hoping that uh, Beam technology today enables us to give better estimates. So 90% uh, of the projects in 2005 uh, were over budgeted. Uh, late delivery of projects, uh, unproductive manpower on sites, uh, constru uh, construction reworked. 30% of all the construction in 2005 had to be uh, fixed at some stage because of uh, the manual labor and because of the very big tolerances that are, uh, that are actually happening in this world. And a lot of material waste. So this is an overview of where we want to come in, and let's see how we want to do it. So uh, analysts that analyze the construction uh, industry realized uh, that the biggest pot potential at, for uh, revenue from digitization is actually in the production and the fabrication uh, stage. There, uh, we can see in this graph on the bottom the amount of penetration in the market. Uh, you, I think it's a bit hard to see the numbers, but the numbers here are ranging from uh, one to two, pretty much, which two, one means no uh, penetration of this technology, and two means very little penetration. So if we look at the production uh, in the construction industry, we see there is 1.3, which means literally nobody uses this technology. And the potential is huge. So what is this all about? So I started to talk about the industrial revolutions. So uh, the first industrial revolution actually happened in the Middle Ages. And an industrial revolution uh, is a change, in a, is a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift which uh, usually uh, incorporates few changes, changes in the way we get energy, changes in the way we produce stuff, and change in the way we communicate. In the Middle Ages, you had this uh, first revolution where we started to use uh, wind and water power. And we started to communicate in a more efficient ways because we invented the printing press. We, we were able to uh, spread ideas faster. Um, Industry point 2.0 began with electricity, where we started to have the automatic uh, factories with a lot of manual labor. In the industry 3.0, where we had the penetration of all the internet technology, we started to have a lot of uh, factories which are managed by computers. But each factory was still a unit on its own. If you look at the entire uh, chain of a market, such as a construction market, um, so it's very segmented. And the, the fact that information is not flowing from all the, from all the people that you, that are in the market uh, is a problem. Like you said uh, before, a lot of metadata is uh, lost when we're moving from one software to another. This metadata would have enabled the manufacturer to manufacture better stuff, more accurate to the needs of the architect. Industry 0.40, the next revolution, is, uh, is, uh, is based on the Internet of Things and big data. It's, it's this stage where we are able to make all the software communicate with each other and pass the data between the different layers of the system. Instead of having a pipeline which the data is going from one direction to the other, we have, we're, go, we're moving into a circular economy. In the circular economy, the manufacturing, the research, and the assembly are all interconnected in this cycle. Instead of uh, manufacturing, just manufacturing what they are, what they are what they think the market wants. We're manufacturing instead by what the market orders. So we are moving from a statistical model where, uh, let's say I'm a brick, uh, I make bricks. So today, if I have a factory, I will make a statistical model. I will assume, OK, uh, one meter on one, me on one meter brick is the most common, and I will, um, and I will uh, produce it in large quantities. <laughs> I might, my prediction might not be accurate, so I will have to stockpile and sell it later. This will increase the cost of one unit. 
and the we have to store these units, we have to ship them, we have to market them. It's very inefficient and it's very predictive. So what we want to do is we want to move to a model where the construction and the production is based on basis of ordering. So the potential of this is reducing the amount of waste of energy, of material, of space, and of time of people across the system. So like I said, the old industry is very segmented. And we are moving to this uh, model where, uh, or we want to move to this model, where the conceptual design and the fabrication part are interconnected from the start. When once a big uh, uh, architectural uh, uh, plan is starting to be built, it's already uh, talking to the uh, software infrastructure of the fabrication factories. So, Let's say to answer the question, if we can fabricate something or not, it's something which doesn't need to be on a model on your computer. It should be on a cloud-based application that synchronizes all the layers of the system from uh, the architect through the fabrication and to the construction site. Because as we know, in a lot of construction sites, the angle is supposed to be 90 degrees, but humans are building it, so it would be 89 degrees. And then you would have the floor builder actually having to cut all the bricks to fit them to the floor, because it's not exactly two on two, it's 199 on 201. So if we could have, we could use the, the internet and the internet of things to get this data from the start, so we could fabricate for each building the exact uh, sizes of each, of each object, we can, let's say, make the floor only after the construction is finished and we can measure it. So uh, we've been uh, working in the last four years on the making uh, a production line. We started from a very uh, grand idea of uh, managing to produce any double curved surface from concrete in any color. Uh, this uh, was a very big challenge and a very interesting one. I'll show you later our results. Uh, but what we realized is that the actual market demand is very low for this. You have got projects that want this, but there are few. And the amount of capital that you need to invest in order to bring this technology to maturity is very big. So we, in last year, we decided to make a change in plans and to move to a more simple model to produce uh, any 2D uh, curvature concrete surfaces in different textures and colors, as you can see here, and to en enable uh, to do the mass series production. For example, you have a minimum order that you can order from the factory, let's say 135 meters of certain type of concrete. But now you can stop thinking that about bricks that are uh, square. You can have them in any size, actually any uh, 2D uh, separation of, uh, of, uh, of a box could work and would, in the end, cost the same. Um, so the potential of our products is uh, exterior, interior cladding, flooring, uh, solid panels, and slabs. This is for the first, first part, which uh, in the next stage, we're going to build more constructive uh, materials, uh, which have to have much stronger properties, which makes them more complex. Um, so basically, our factories are going to be completely automatic. And because the time is finished, we will move to the fun part. Oh, wait. So this is the, f the part where I explain the R&D. So here we can see a bit of uh, double uh, curved surfaces. So uh, at the beginning, we started to work with EPS and uh, hot wire, and uh, we uh, developed a system which fabricates uh, mold very efficiently. As you can see here, we have a vacuum cleaner that, uh, that collects all the EPS. For anybody who uses EPS, it, it's very actually ugly to work with it. And so we found a few solutions to make it uh, uh, more productive. Uh, 
the next stage uh, in this production line was uh, sealers. So uh, we uh, tried a lot, a lot of materials um, to, and to automatically apply the sealer on the EPS. The reason we want to do it is that we want uh, the EPS to be uh, smooth because we want to get this kind of surfaces, which are perfect. You don't need to do anything. They're colored already. Um, so this uh, is a very hard challenge, but we did manage to get a few products from this production line. So here we are spraying the concrete on the mold. As you can see, we managed to uh, find a specific, specific formulation that enable us to spray the concrete without the, the concrete spilling, although the surface itself is curved. This is a nearly a contradictive uh, quality that we are trying to, to get from the concrete. On the other hand, you want it to stick uh, and to be in an equal layer, and, the, and then you don't want it to have too strong contact with the mold so you, because you need to extract it later. So uh, later we moved to, uh, we tried a few ranges of uh, materials. We found that plastic-based materials work for us the best. So this is a mold that we created with a robot. And in the next stage, you can see how, uh, how a, a, a double curved concrete slab from this mold looks like. Although this looks quite uh, nice, to make this uh, an, a full mass customization uh, production line would be inefficient. Because you would need to, for each uh, small brick like this, you would need to mill the EPS. And when you start to look at the big scales, it's a lot of waste of material and of energy. Next thing we, we, we try to, to do is to make the same kind of mold and engrave logos. So this was a very fun experiment. Here we can see a concrete slab with a logo of some company. And this was the first uh, actually slab that we created fully in a fully automatic manner, uh, which was very exciting. And in the next stage, we combined both technologies and we embedded the logo on a, on a double curved surface. So when we realized that this is not practical, we decided to move to, uh, the, to a simpler concept. Uh, as for me, as an R&D manager, we developed the technology uh, to set up these uh, factories fast. Because one major uh, problem with the robotic factories is that the, today, in most uh, industries, you have engineers that program each robot specifically to do one task its entire life, which is the opposite of how we perceive robotics. So uh, we had to develop uh, a few technologies for that. So the first was the simulation. We need to, we need to be able to simulate our, our process. Si So we also wanted to have some solution for uh, small fabrication labs that, want, that will have one robot, but will want to use a few end effectors and to do it automatically. So we uh, integrated tool changers. So this is our robotic cell. Uh, we have here a few type of robots. And we can see the control of all these robots at the same time. But for a robotic uh, mass customization factory, to work, we need to have safety. And safety is a big issue because if the computer program generates a program for the robot itself, and not for a single robot, but for a fleet of robots that have to cooperate together. So even the smallest bug in the system could be catastrophic. The big robots that we saw before, each one of them weighs two tons. So if one robot collides with another, it's a big damage for equipment. And if it collides with a human, well, I don't want to think about it. So we had to uh, develop a lot of uh, capabilities for this. So the first one is the real-time collision detection. That, uh, as you see, the robotic system managed to stop itself before it touches uh, the, the table. I was operating this manually with a control, but the computer system all the time simulates what's going on in the cell and stops things before they happen. The next thing we, we, we wanted to experience was how to make different UIs to control the robots. And one intuitive UI is to use a tablet for drawing. 
So basically, what we realized is when uh, we worked on this stuff is that if you, take, if you want to take, let's say, a regular picture and print it with a robot, you already lost a lot of the metadata that was in the picture. Because usually pictures, I'm not a um, painting, for example, okay? A human being is drawing the painting. So there is actually, in the painting itself, you have information, the curvature of the hand. So this uh, data is lost if you just take a regular digital file. So we decided to see what happens if we take this data and use it. So this is our simulator simulating the process. And of course, implementing it in the real world. So this very uh, funny idea is actually very practical. Think about what we have lost since we, in the last century, in construction. I mean, if you look at uh, houses at the Middle Ages or the Renaissance, you see a lot of decoration on the walls. You see a lot of paintings. Today, it's not practical. You're not going to pay uh, some artist to go over your uh, ceiling and uh, make decoration. But on the other hand, you could have a painter painting a picture one time, saving all the metadata of the movements of his hand. And then later, you can fabricate it with a robot anywhere with very high accuracy. Um, so, um, one last thing we didn't get to is the type of mass customization that we're able to create in our new factory. So first of all is a shape. As you can see from above, we can uh, pretty much cut the slab any shape we want. Uh, we can make this type of connectors which have an angle. Um, and we can also, we also use 3D printing to make borders for, uh, for constructive uh, uh, concrete. So we can make, uh, this is in the next stage of the factory. And of course, all the coloring and textures. Um, so this is our chocolate color, the favorite uh, color of the company. And uh, as you can see, we have got many, many different uh, looks. You can come. I managed to bring all the small ones, um, so you can observe. And uh, so what's the future? So this model that we are looking at in Beyond 3D is industry 0.35, because it's not a complete mass customization, and we don't have the full integration of the big data, because we still, to have this uh, information, we need to have integration with all the, all the layers. We need to have integration with the academy. We need to have integration with the architects. We need to have integration with the builders. So for this network uh, to work, we need to collaborate. And I think this is the main uh, thing that people should take from this uh, talk today, not only mine, the, the, the need for us from all these different perspectives of this industry to collaborate and to move to a world which is more efficient and need less manual work to produce our needs. Thank you.